Hey, what's up guys? I am Joe from Workbench, and this week we're gonna talk about mastering master properties and one layer to rule them all. All right guys, today we're gonna to be checking out a new feature in After Effects called Master Properties. If you wanna know how to set them up, I'm gonna link a great School of Motion tutorial down below, but they basically work like any Essential Graphics panel stuff. So you just pull up an Essential Graphics panel and then you drag your properties in there and then they'll show up in your main comps. They show up down here like this. So you see how we have master properties opened up and there's this thing in here called layer index. This references a slider in our pre-comps that lets us show different items with the same comp. So these are actually the same comp displaying different things, which has a whole bunch of uses that I've only even just scratched the surface on. So let's take a look at this squares comp. So you see down here on the bottom, I have a controller null and all that has is a slider on it called layer index. If we click through these, you can see that they just reference different layers. So each one of these things has an expression on it that basically just checks to see if that slider value is equal to the index. And if it is, it sets it to 100, otherwise it sets it to zero. So as you can see, this comp can be set to whatever, and then we still have this set there because this value basically overrides whatever that comp is set to at any moment. So I can change these in here independently of each other, and it'll show me different parts of that same pre-comp. Again, I wanna stress how awesome that is. So I made this test and it's based on our radial delay tutorial. It's like tutorial number two, but instead of delaying these things in time, we're just picking a different part of that pre-comp. I've delayed the rotation in that pre-comp. So they also kind of have a time delay too, but we're not actually doing anything like that, which saves us in processing. So this expression is pretty simple. I'm not gonna go too in depth on it because again, that's explained in tutorial number two. Basically though, we're gonna get our position and then we're gonna check our new controller in this layer, which has a number in it that corresponds to how many layers we actually have available to use in that pre-comp. In this case, it's set to six. Then we're gonna find out how far over our layer is in X and Y, and square those, and add them together here in D, and take the square root of that, so that using Pythagorean theorem, we get a distance from the center of the comp. And then when we do a linear expression of that distance, as we go from zero to 1102, which is the distance from the center to a corner, we're gonna pick layers from one to the number of that slider, so one to six. And then we round it so that we get an integer because in the other comp, we're checking to see if the index is exactly that number. So if this gives us something like 1.5, layer one is not gonna show up without that rounding. So that's how that's set up. So then of course, you know me, I wanted to go further with it. So if we go on this controller here and we go through the index slider here, you can see that I've kind of tried to set this one up so that as we go through the different layers, things get filled in more. You might notice I'm using a bunch of layers here with the same name. In this case, if we open up the opacity here, click on this and bring it into our expressionist. You can see now we're checking if the name of this layer is equal to that index slider. And if that's the case, it's gonna be full on opacity, otherwise zero. There's a couple of ways that this can actually be improved. One of the things I did was that I actually named these like 06 dash like box or whatever it is. And I just did like this dot name dot substring zero comma two. So if we add that back to here, it's still gonna work. Because what that's going to do is just take the first two characters and compare that. That has the added bonus of when you duplicate one of these things, it doesn't become like 08. It'll still say like 07 dash whatever. So it keeps you having an idea of what it is. And if you want to duplicate different parts of the same layer that you want to show, you don't have to worry about After Effects renaming it on you. The other thing you can do is instead of 100 here, you can put value. So you can still have things be transparent if you'd like. In this comp, pretty much everything is full on opaque, so it doesn't really matter. So that gets put into a comp called generator, which I thought I had open, but I didn't. That one you can see takes a second to load. And that's because if you look here, we have 2,306 layers in this comp. This is a variant of one of our ASCII generator tutorials. I think it was number 65. And the basic idea here is that we actually have that many layers across this whole thing. As you can see, it takes a second to follow my cursor around. Although it actually doesn't take terribly long to render. And each one of these layers checks its position and takes the gray value that's under it, and then using in our controller layer, the slider that has the number of elements in our pre-comp that we're using, figures out which one of these should map to that gray value, and it shows us that one. So under here, if I turn this lock off, we can go into the map layer. You can see this is also combining our tutorial and filming elements, which I believe is 116. I'm gonna link all these things down below, so check that out. But I took one of the things of the airport signage, mirrored it around a bit, and if we run this, you can see this is what we get. As I'm recording right now, this goes about two frames per second, but it can go about five or so if you're not doing anything else. I'll just play it a little bit so you can get a taste of what happens. So this gives you kind of an interesting background of just little elements. 
I didn't animate these, but they can be if you want them to be. So of course there's a ton of complexity you can add to this. I have all these layers shied because if you actually have them unshied, you won't be able to get to the bottom of this. And I wanted the map to be on the bottom. So let's unshy this real quick. After like a thousand layers or so, it stops showing them properly anymore. These like disappear and it just gets weird. If I hit this and I open it up and we click on this layer index and we bring that into Expressionist, we can look at how we're doing this really quickly. So this whole thing is in a math.round and that's because we need our index to be an integer. So then we're doing this comp.layer map. So we're looking at the map. So our map could be on top if you want, but just in my head, I like to have it at the bottom. And then we're doing dot sample image position. So it's the position of this layer itself. And then we're taking zero, which is just going to be the red value. This is a gray map under here, so it doesn't really matter which one of the ones that you pick. And then we're going to multiply that by this comp dot layer controller effect max slider. So that max again represents how many elements are in each one of these pre comps. So we're multiplying this gray value, which will be a value from zero to one and multiplying that by the number of the slider. So at zero, it's obviously zero. At one, it's the maximum number of elements that we have. So that'll give us a nice range, and we round it, we'll drop off those decimal places, and pick whichever element should be shown. And that's how that's set up. So last week in a project, I did all these like distortions and glitches and stuff. And one thing I made was kind of like a uh, grain pattern, just out of like a rectangle that like changed its size based on this random value that would update like every few frames. So I decided to put this stuff in a comp and see what it would look like if I used the same kind of expressions on it. I'm not changing the size of a rectangle, obviously, but I'm picking a different part of that pre-comp. So in this way, I can have all sorts of different things pop up. Let me go down to the bottom of our comp here. You can see I have 20 layers of this pre-comp, and there's a little bit of a variation in the options that they have, but I'll explain that in a moment. The first thing that we're going to look at, though, is our controller. There's a bunch of different things in here that I have set. So random seed, obviously, that's going to change the randomness of each one of these things. And most of these are actually set in our essential graphics panel so that they're master properties. The selection is one that's really interesting because this actually lets you select how many of these layers are being used. So if I set this to one, it's only going to use the first layer. So if I play it, you can see it just skips around. If I put this on 20, we're using all of the layers. Then I have items here. And I've called this different things in different comps just because I was kind of trying to work out what I should call it. But this again is the number of items in one of these pre-comps. So there's seven different items in there so that we have it set to seven. And then here I have this thing called quantize. And what this does is make sure that it aligns up to the grid that I have set in the other comps. If I turn this off, they're more random. So I'm gonna turn that back on. All right, so let's take a look at some of the expressions on these things. First, let's start on the bottom of this later index. Again, this is a master property of this small square elements comp. So this is what we use to pick which one of these things it shows. So let's pull that into expressionist. And you can see on this layer, I have two sliders, speed and visibility. Visibility is only used in opacity, and it's basically a percentage of how frequently we'll see the element. That'll make sense in a minute when I explain exactly how this works. So the basic setup for these things is that we use seed random set to timeless. And as I've explained before, if you set your seed random to timeless, your randomizations don't happen every frame. They only happen when the seed changes. So basically this speed is going to affect how fast that seed is going to change. So that's why we're setting S to the speed slider. And then max is going to be set to our number of items in the controller. And our seed is going to be set to the seed in the controller. Okay, so then we're going to set up our seed random. And again, for this to work, we want to hold the value and then change it. So that the seed then changes and our random values will be different. So to do that, we're basing it on time. And that initially makes no sense because time changes every frame. So the seed would change every frame. But instead, we're going to floor the time. And math.floor basically just gets rid of the decimal places in numbers. So as time creeps up from like 0 to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, whatever, it's going to be 0 until we get to the next integer, which would be 1. And then from 1, it'll stay 1 until we get 2. So instead of counting all the fractional parts up to a second, we're just counting from 0 to 1 to 2 at the normal time it goes. But in order to make that faster or slower, we have the speed setting that's multiplying to time, but we're flooring that entire value. So even if speed is set to 10, we're just increasing the rate of time 10 times, but we're still gonna have hold periods between the full seconds. And again, that would be a 10th of a second in real time if you're multiplying by 10. So if this speed is set to 0.5, which will make it half speed, instead of this changing at one second, it'll change at two seconds. If speed is set to zero, it'll never change. So hopefully that makes sense. 
And then to that, we're adding the seed value from the controller. This is just so that we can get different looks. And then this true is just that setting of the timeless property I was talking about. And so then our next line is just going to pick whichever piece of that pre-comp that we're going to use. And we're going to floor that value again. You could also use round here if you want to. And that's just so that we end up with an even number because again, we're checking the name of the layers. And since I didn't name anything like 01.2, I don't want anything in here like 1.2. So we're going to pick a random value here from zero to max. Max again being the number of items in these pre-comps. Note that I don't have anything set up as zero. And that's so that we can actually have nothing be wherever black is if we're mapping it to something. So that's how that's set up. Then the next thing we have is opacity. And this is where that visibility slider comes in. If I bring this in, we can see that. All right, so the first thing we're doing here is we're checking to see if our index value is less than our selection value from our controller layer plus one. So if the controller layer is set to 20, we're gonna add one to that so that it's 21. And then if our index is from one to 20, we're then gonna do our visibility check and it can be visible. Otherwise, we're just gonna straight make it invisible. So it's gonna be zero. That's what this else part is here. So you might wonder why I'm adding one here and doing this less than check instead of doing like less than or equal to. And that's generally because it's faster to do this kind of comparison than it is to do less than or equal to. And since this might be calculated a lot, we should do it as fast as possible so that our rendering is faster. So then we're gonna set a variable V equal to one minus our effect visibility slider. And the reason I'm doing that is because if I want this to be seen 90% of the time, which would be 0.9, I'd rather set this to 0.9 than 0.1%. And that is because the way our comparison is gonna be, we're gonna check if a random value from zero to one is greater than visibility. So for 90% visibility, this V value needs to be 0.1. I just realized I probably could and should make this comparison as less than instead to save us this calculation. And then I'll actually let me show you guys something else. So let me add that here, move this out of the way for a moment. All right, so I'm gonna do this copy expression only. And I'm gonna paste it on all the rest of these layers. And the thing I wanna mention is that that doesn't work with master properties. So you can't select this layer index, even though they all have the same property and do copy expression only and paste it to all of them because that will do nothing. That can be a big issue if you're using that generator comp with 2,304 or whatever layers because you can't just copy and paste it to all of them and have it work again. You basically have to delete them all and redo it all. I'm using stack it to make that grid. So it's not as big of a deal to have to redo all those other than trying to select them all. So just keep in mind, you can't copy things like that. You'll have to rebuild it. That is an unfortunate drawback, but that is what it is. I can kind of understand why that wouldn't happen seeing as these can be pretty much anything. Also be careful about messing up the expressions here. Like if you replace this layer with another source item or something like that, because for some reason, undo will not bring back the expressions on master properties. Also note before I forget that I'm also gonna put these expressions on our website in the post about this tutorial. So if you wanna build this yourself, you can copy and put these expressions in wherever you want. The project file will pretty much be as this is, set up and ready to go, including having that generator laid out with all the layers in it. So you can just throw something in there and it's good to go. I found that throwing an old spot in here yielded some interesting results. Okay, so let's look at this position value, bring that into expressionist as well. And again, we're using a very similar setup to the previous ones. We're getting that speed slider, we're getting that random seed. We're doing that same seed random. And then we're gonna check if we have quantized set. And if we do, we're basically checking out two different random numbers for X and Y. And these correspond to the number of columns we have. So we're going from zero to 63 because we have 64 columns. This can't be one to 64 because otherwise we'd be skipping an edge here. And that might make sense here in a moment when I explain the rest of this. So we do that for X and Y. We're rounding it so that we get an actual integer. And then we're adding 0.5 to that. And the reason that is, is because we're going to be multiplying this by 30 for each one so we get its actual position that it should be. So the first column, ignoring that 0.5, would be 0 times 30, so it would be 0, and then 1 times 30 would be 30, then 2 times 30 would be 60, and so on, so that these actually space out in their columns. The 0.5 is because our anchor point is in the middle of a 30 by 30 square. So when we multiply this 0.5 by this 30, and note that that's added outside of the random rounding and all that stuff because that'll give us 15. So this would be 15 if it's zero, which puts it right against the edge or 45 or 75 and so on. So that's how we quantize the position of these layers to fit in the columns. If we don't have quantized checked, it's much simpler. And then we're taking our value and then we're gonna do a random value from on either side above and below and everything. Although I think this actually could be faster as well without having to do that calculation. So let's do this. Let's make this random from zero 
And for speed, I'm going to hard code the value in here. But you can actually use this comp.width if you want to. Let's click that and add it here. And then I'm going to do that copy expression only because this is an actual property, not a master property. And then I'm just going to paste. And that's it for that. All right, so what did I do with that? Well, I built this. I'm using a mat that I used in something else the other day to bring the logo on. But everything else comes from this project. That transition will be included with a project file if you want to grab that. So I'm using that grain that we just looked at and I'm coloring it yellow, but I also have another copy of it that has a different random seed and a different number of layers that pulls out white ones. As you can see, they pop in every once in a while because there's less of those. And so that is what we end up with. So again, from our parking garage, we've taken that, we've added a bunch of different things over top of it. We have a little bit of this digital grain over top of everything else popping in. And all of that was made with basically one pre-comp that has a couple of layers in it, mapped over an image, and then just randomly dispersed across all of this. But the simple fact now that you can take one comp and add all sorts of little elements into it and display a whole bunch of things out of it is incredibly powerful compared to the way we used to work in After Effects. I am positive there's way more stuff that you can do with this. I mean, just lower thirds and stuff that now you don't have to make a different comp for every one of them. You can have individualized text that renders out differently on different layers of the same comp. That's just awesome. So hopefully we'll explore more of that as we go along. Our April is kind of full up though, so we might not go that crazy into it. But I will try with every project that I have coming up to see if I can use this in some cool way that I can show you guys. Oh yeah, and before I forget, uh, I should probably announce a winner for that 15k giveaway since we're almost at 20k. I went back through my tweets and I saw anybody that could have been even close to fitting the description of tweeting out one of our tutorials. And I laid out the names in a document. I went to Google, which apparently has a random number generator. I clicked the button a bunch of times, looked at the screen, saw that number, it was four. And in the list, that was Andrew Kaz at Instarus. So congrats on that. I will get in contact with you soon so that you can get that package from Amazing Music Tracks. All right, guys, if you have any comments or questions, leave them in the comments down below. And if you'd like to help support what we do, check out patreon.com slash workbench. We've recently switched our tiers over to monthly, and that kind of allowed us to bring the cost of them down a little bit. Almost every tier includes our project files. Other tiers include stuff like this transition mat. I just made a bunch of those, so that kind of stuff is going to be up soon. Just a bunch of different things that you can drop in and have a nice library of stuff built up. So if you considered it in the past, I would say check it out again. It might be a better deal for you. And if not, no worries. All right, make sure you keep up with the blog at workbench.tv. Every once in a while, I'll put up something like expression-based or whatever that's not flashy to look at, but has a lot of information that you might find useful. And again, the expressions for this tutorial will be on our site as well at the page for this tutorial. All right, that is it. As always, I am Joe, and we'll see you next week. Bye.